Okay, well, welcome to another uh, online workshop with Evan and I. Um, this time it's going to be high level PCB design. Uh, today we're going to go over um, like a really um, broad overview on more advanced features of Eagle. We're going to be using Eagle CAD um, for all the people who are doing like MicroMouse or uh, AP. This would be um, geared for you guys. And um, we're also going to go over some uh, good design tips at the end. Yeah, so. So here's the overview, basically what I just said. Um, so yeah, for all of you who um, are new to Eagle, we did a workshop one uh, just about Eagle Basic. So basically like the layout of the whole screen and like the whole procedure from going to schematic to um, the board. And um, this workshop or this lecture will assume that you already have like somewhat of a knowledge about how Eagle works and where most of the tools are and how to make certain like circuits. Um, and then we're gonna be introducing some more um, really useful Eagle features and um, particularly how to make libraries and custom components. Um, that's pretty important because like you're just finding a bunch of components online, it's really hard. And um, we're also gonna be going over some PCB design tips, including um, polygons, thermals, orphans. We're gonna tell you all about why they're useful um, also, decoupling and bypass capacitors. Capacitors are really important for um, ensuring that we have the right uh, signal levels on the board. And then one really, really good aspect about like how to judge whether a good PCB is good or bad is to use EMC and EMI. So those stand for electromagnetic, um, shoot, <laughs> electromagnetic capability or something, and then electromagnetic interference. And so we're, go, we're gonna go over that later on. And um, there's like a several um, tips that you can ensure that you have a really good PCB. And so we're gonna do that with an example and we're just gonna look over uh, what's wrong with this PCB and how to fix it. All right, so Evan's gonna take you through a lot of the Eagle features and yeah. So first okay, so yeah. this is the Eagle free download if you do not have it. As you know, it's freeware, so you're limited to the size of board you can have and the number of layers you can have, so just the top and the bottom. If you had the actual software, you'd be, you'd have like up to um, 16 different like inner layers. So, okay, let me just go to the next slide. So the- Hmm? That's our president, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Okay, so just the environment, the picture on the left shows the schematic layout. Basically, that's where you put circuit schematics that you want to be able to um, make into a board. So this is where your circuits will basically functionally, functionally look and work. So you can put your resistors on here, make your LED circuits or 555 timer circuit or put your MCU on here. Basically, um, you add the components there first, then you make a board from it. So the board, um, basically is how the PCB will look when you actually get it made. So it'll have all the connections on it. You'll have to route the different components on the board using both layers, figure out what the best way to put the planes on, that sort of stuff. So I guess one of the first features we're gonna be talking about is um, making your own parts in Eagle. Sometimes you'll just, you'll have uh, a specific part in mind that you wanna be able to make, but you're not gonna be finding it in the provided Eagle libraries. So um, if you don't already know, here, can I screen share? Yeah, go ahead. If you don't already know, um, Eagle comes with some pre-made libraries already, but if you want to create your own, you just go to new, you go to library, create it. So basically you have several things. The device is the actual like It'll be the thing that you add to your symbol that will go to you, or that will add to your um, schematic layout that will get put on your board. So basically, you'll create a um, footprint for it first. You don't have to worry about 3D package. So when you want to create a footprint, just give it a name. Basically, you'll be set out into the environment again. So you'll have to select through the different layers that you want to be doing. So say I just wanted an SMD component to begin with. I'd put however many SMD pads I wanted. I could put something on the silk screen. So the silk screen layer that you're gonna wanna be using to write stuff is, is the T-place. So um, 
we'll put some lines on just to create an outline of it. Well, don't put it on the actual component, maybe put it around it. And a lot of like the physical dimensions and everything you'll be getting from the component. Um, data sheet. Yeah, the data sheet. And it'll have the actual uh, sizes and you can go off of that to create your part. Mm -hmm. well, this is just a, basically a rough way of doing it. If you want to do a through hole component, you can use the pads feature, do square, circle, all that, that sort of stuff. Uh, the important part is just figuring out which layers things go on, right? So mostly you're going to be using the top and T place, but if you want to put a name or something like that, you can just place it on the um, name layer. You do text, enter uh, the name, my part, put it there. You can do the same thing with the values. So these are just mainly for utility when you're actually making your component. So say I was done with this component and I wanted to make the symbol for it now so that I could actually put it in a circuit in the um, schematic view. You just go to symbol, create new symbol blah, and basically do the same sort of thing. So this is a lot more free because it's just a symbol. It's a drawing that you get to do for it. So I could put you know, some sort of shape in if I wanted, like say a circle. But the only thing that, though, well, the important thing is that I put in several different pins corresponding to the number of pads or through hole portions that I want to connect things to, right? So now I'm done with that. I'll go to device, new device. Uh, we'll call it blah. It's probably a good convention just to make everything have the same name. That way you can recognize it. Once you're here, you will add a local package. So this is for the actual um, board component. So we can see that I have my block component. Okay, now if I want to add the symbol for it here, I'll go to add part, go to blah. Okay, this is the one I want to use, put it here. So now we just have to match these two things up. That's how this has four pads, this has four connections. So I'll hit the connect button. And basically is if I had named these components beforehand, they would um, have corresponding names. So I could name like say this pin here, ground, this pin here, ground as well. They'd have the corresponding names and it'd be easier to connect them, but for now it doesn't really matter. So I'll just connect corresponding pins, hit okay. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little green check mark right there. That means that all the um, parts have been actually connected to each other. So that means it's basically good to go. So you can save, uh, give your library a name. This will be blah, and you're good to go. So you can exit out of this. We'll ah. Oops, not that one. No, this is not what I want. I want a schematic. So we'll go to tools, oops, library, library manager, available. So we'll look for another one. Here we go. Here's my part. Oh, wait, no, it's blah. I want blah. So we'll take blah, use. So now it's in our design. So that means I can look for the component name. So we'll use the add feature. We'll search for blah. Perfect. There's my component. I can place it down and create a board from it. And there's blah. Perfect. So some other things that you might want to consider is the origin is probably going to be your origin point. So I placed this first pad as my origin. Um, but you can sort of change how that goes. You can also change basically um, there's other layers that you can design for, such as these keep out regions. Basically, they're They'll sort of give you errors if you um, put other things over them. But that's the basics of it, actually. So yeah. OK, here, I'll go back to Henry's screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and creating your own parts is important. Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, cr uh, creating your own parts is important because um, Sometimes when you're online, uh, you can't really find the Eagle uh, package for it or the specific library for it. So it might be faster to create your own. 
And so that's what that's for. So yeah, now we're on to adding parts. Um, yeah, so after that, you can now this find your own uh, parts with the add command, like you said. And so, okay. yep. Did you go over? Uh, yeah, okay. There, oh, there we go. I put one resource on this page, actually. It's a okay. website called Snap EDA. They have a bunch of like user-made parts, basically, that um, say, you know, you order something from DigiKey and it's not in one of the DigiKey libraries already. Well, someone out there has probably made it, so you can mm -hmm. look it up first. If it's not there, that's when you probably want to make your own part. There's yeah, also I use another Snap EDA a lot. <laughs> There's another online tool as well that I didn't know much about until um, Alex actually told me about it. And apparently one of his GP members had told him about it. It's called library.io. It's basically an Eagle utility for helping you create um, three-dimensional models of your parts. But it also creates the um, board, or I don't know what you would call it. Basically the board outline, so what goes on the final PCB and the um, oh, actual the schematic symbol as well. Yeah, it creates the, fo the footprint and the schematic symbol for you. So you can just um, basically, it has basically predefined packages already, and it's really easy to use. It's a parametric designer. So all you have to do is enter in um, the parameters of what the data sheet's saying for the lengths um, that the pins are, are like separated by, how big the pins are, what's the actual overall package size, and it basically simplifies this whole process. You don't have to worry about the um, layers or anything like that. It's just boom. Yeah, so library IO, go check it out. <laughs> all right, so um, yeah, this basically goes over all that. All right, so the, yeah, yeah. Because, if there's time at the end, I might uh, do a little demonstration of what that actually looks like. Oh, but yeah. It's, okay. it's really intuitive too. Nice. Apparently, there's uh, it's a lot easier than the one that Eagle provides. All right. Well, this so is, this is actually like a um, new utility that I think Eagle actually made because it's it's basically uh, part of Autodesk. It's like one of their websites. Oh so, dang! So like they improved it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. All right. Um. So yeah. Um. That's one really cool feature. Thank you, Evan. And uh, next up, we're gonna go in. Uh, more into high level PCB design, more of like the general tips that you can use with any PCB designer, except we're gonna introduce some tools um, associated with Eagle as well. So um, yeah, let's go into that. So yeah, first of all, uh, I think a lot of you guys in uh, MicroMouse and AP are very familiar with this already, but uh, we didn't cover it in our first workshop and this is kind of like a continuation of that. So um, I guess going from uh, traces, a lot of you guys already know in that first picture down below, I think down here, um, you can see that um, there's the components, and this is on the board side, mind you. So um, the board uh, is here, and we have all the components placed in, and then now uh, we've traced all of them, and that works. Um, there's two ways of making connections in Eagle. Uh, we've done it th this way through uh, traces, but a lot of the times uh, you want to use uh, polygon, and so physically that would mean uh, creating like an area where you, it's like a copper pore of a certain area and basically exposes some of the, uh, or kind of merges a lot of the connections that you have there together. And Eagle does this automatically. All you have to do is just draw like an outline with the polygon command. And so you, a good analogy that I um, find very relatable is using like the paint bucket. It's very similar, like kind of fills that area in um, with that certain connection. So there's like a specific value and you would usually want to do this for ground and, uh, or voltage uh, or like power signals. And so it would merge that entire area, as you can see on the picture on the bottom below where the arrow is pointing to it, it merges that entire high bright red with that same signal. And so it's like very, uh, uh, very intuitive because all of those signals are connected together. And I think we have a hand here. So yeah. if you could unmute yourself and then, yeah. Yeah, um, I've read somewhere online that um, sometimes it's advisable you make the polygon or the ground plane before you route, start routing or something. Can you s speak to that? Do you recommend that or not? Or do you just leave it as the last step always? Um, yeah, Could Evan, do you have a response to leave that? Leave it as the last step just because like, so 
the first step that you should think about in like actually deciding what you're doing is placing your components onto the board, right? Not necessarily connecting them, but putting them in such a way that you have basically um, like components near each other. So if like say I have a capacitor, a resistor, an LED and um, a driver, they're all part of like one circuit. I would want to have them close together, right? Just so that they're like grouped. Yeah, of course. So then like once I know that, maybe I can be like, oh, okay. So I sort of know group here, group here, group here, group here. I'm going to put a ground plane that goes underneath what I need it to, right? Right. So once you have that plane or the planes that you think you need, then probably after that is where you want to start doing like your actual routing. Okay. Yeah, so I guess in short, um, yes, <laughs> you want to uh, create your polygons before um, doing your signals. Uh, I guess that that is true for like the very general case. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I do it. Where you normally just um, I just do polygons for my ground and my uh, power signals, and then with the physical or just the, like the I/O, like the analog and digital um, signals, I just go in and manually trace. So yeah. Okay. Do you usually put ground or power on the same side as the components, or do you oh, put them on the other side? Oh, that's a question. We're actually going to answer that in a further slide, but um, just to give you a quick answer, yes, it depends on uh, where you put your components, what uh, orientation your polygons are. And that has something to do with uh, EMI, like the interference. Um, yeah, and so we're, we're going to go over that a little bit more later. It has also something to do with like decoupling capacitors and it you can get like a cleaner signal um, if you right. do it correctly. Cool, thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Great question. So um, this is just yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, no. Wait, you do you want me to do the slide or? Yeah, yeah. Just go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So this is just a note about um, polygons. So you can have multiple polygons on the same basically side. So you can see um, for this example on the left picture, there's two polygons both on the top plane. And you can't really see it, but the second polygon that has the outline goes through the first polygon. So basically what you can do is you can set ranks for the polygons to like take, uh, take precedence over each other. So if they overlap, one will be the one that's actually made while the other one will be cut out. So the one on the left has rank one, while the one on the right or sort of underneath it has rank two. The picture on the right is what it ends up um, making because of this. It creates the separation region because you don't want those planes to be connecting since they're different signals, right? So this is also one way of saying, or like of basically, um, oops, sorry. Organizing uh, how you want your polygons to be on the board. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes um, you're gonna be, the purpose of the eagle is to make your job All right, the purpose of Sorry, I just got something popped up. <laughs> um, yes. The purpose of the uh, polygon uh, is, or purpose of Eagle polygons is to make it easier. And so in order for them to do that, they, they can have these useful features such as the rank so that um, basically you don't have to go in and delete like what are called orphans, which we'll go over a little bit later. Yeah. So um, I guess next up, we can go over um, another very useful Eagle setting. Um, or I guess it's uh, common throughout a lot of like PCB design. And so it's called thermals. And so uh, notice here in uh, one of the pictures um, here that we have uh, thermals um, being implemented. And um, what's very uh, significant about this is that there's like a gap in between the pad and uh, the, uh, the rest of the uh, plane that it's connected to. And so without thermals, it's just fully connected and it's basically all filled in with copper. And so um, this is uh, really, uh, or having thermals is a very useful feature because it enables um, you to be able to solder um, more easily. Having uh, one connected portion or no thermals would result in uh, all the heat being dissipated into the entire ground into the entire plane and it'll be a lot more difficult to solder and so thermals is a very useful feature especially for beginners um, to make it easier for them to solder essentially yeah um, so yeah. having those thin wires basically the thermals um, 
Well, the thin, thin wires conduct heat better than, you know, larger circles. So in Micromass and Eric Copter, you usually have thermals off because you're looking at more like, you're more signal oriented than that. They're not really concerned about how uh, difficult it is for you to solder, which, you know, it's fairly difficult, but having the thin little traces helps the um, joint heat up better. The small con is that it creates a, a region of higher impedance due to the small trace width as like, um, I'm sure you know, like resistance is PL over A. So the longer a trace and uh, the shorter or the smaller the area of it, of the basically the circumference times pi, you'll have, um, I'm sorry, not circumference times pi. Just thinner wires have more impedance. So pi that's squared, one pi small pi problem. Squared. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, no, that's fine. I mean, just area. Um, yeah, so I guess it depends on your skill level when you're using thermals and um, we have something in the chat. Um, would this be bad for parts that produce a lot of heat since there's less dissipation to the plane? Let's see. So like bad for parts, um, you, are you saying that there would be heat being put onto the output of the, uh, of the device? Wait. I think he's thinking that in nor is are you asking like in normal operation like if this would produce a lot of heat oh, from the device uh, so like say say you have like your power or your voltage regulator or some like something that produces like a lot of heat uh, would the fact that you have thermals on uh, be a, a bottleneck for the dissipation into the ground plane um I would have to say not necessarily I mean. In theory, yes, but like the distance is so short and the rest of the ground plane is so large that the act, like the impedance of the whole entire thing will be rather small in the first place. So unless you're trying to do something that has an extraordinary amount of voltage for your PCB, um, I don't think the current will get high enough for it to actually heat up that much. All right. Cool. Okay, thanks. So good question. Uh, we're going to move on. Um, yeah, so also another um, feature that we're interested in is the orphans on uh, dealing particularly with unconnected polygons. So as we said before, Eagle is really nice and it lets you um, outline this area for your polygons on a layer. And so then you'll be like, okay, so this will be all ground, all 3.3 volts. And so what happens if you then go in and use your traces and then you cut Essentially, you can see um, with, uh, with orphans and then without orphans, you have a, a trace that cuts through and then um, basically that uh, top portion is not connected to anything. It's just like a uh, kind of like lone piece of copper. And so essentially um, that will create some uh, EMI, some noise that would kind of like radiate uh, from your PCB. And so we wouldn't really want that. And so normally, uh, you want to turn orphans on or orphans off. Yeah. So There's then also, it kind of cleans it up a little bit better. You have to be careful when making your own polygons. Like if you're making your polygons first and you try and rat's nest without orphans on, it won't actually fill in the area because it doesn't have any physical connections in there. So basically the reason why the top disappeared is because it's not connected to any other like um, actual component while the bottom plane, I mean the bottom portion is connected to ground. This is a, a um, ground plane and mm -hmm. the STM32 has several pins that are connected to, or I at least labeled one to be connected to ground. So that's why it's actually connected. So yeah. if, the, if it's not connected to other components in the circuit, your polygon, then it will disappear. I actually wonder why, um, people use orphans on setting. So maybe we have to take a look into that, but uh, maybe there's a benefit to that. So we'll, we might come back to that in a future workshop. Um, I mean, sometimes you're looking for like actual, yeah. like just you want to be able to couple something like that so that you leave something off of it, but. I mean, yeah, I guess. Cause like the only time I would think like, oh, you want an orphan is like, <laughs> that sounds like so bad <laughs> but like um is it if you're like working in progress and you haven't made that connection but you're gonna make it later and then so it's just like you won't delete it 
I could yeah, so you put a V something. on it and then you make a connection somewhere or you connect yeah. another component into it. That makes sense. All right, so our next topic here is like a, a general PCB design so this is, rule. Yeah. This is about like, you can use VS to connect two different planes. Yeah. So basically these are both the same plane, but they're on different sides. Thank you. Just because of like, say the, um, your design needed you to do this or something like that, right? So you can use basically these vias to sort of normalize the voltage across the whole thing. Like if you did have any potential like voltage changes in this area, um, having only one via to connect them potentially creates a voltage difference between the two ends, right? Yeah, like so a bottleneck. These, yeah, so having these vias helps um, basically just normalize this. It's especially helpful when you're doing um, PCBs that are multiple layers. So say you have a whole entire um, ground plane on one and then you have a ground plane like two layers over, you'll want to try and connect them through something like this, just basically so that they um, will have the same voltage in multiple places on the board instead of just only being connected in one place and having a potential difference somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, one really good way to like kind of visualize this because Eagle um, works with layers is to have that layers mentality. And so keep in mind that uh, I guess for AP and MicroMouse, we're working with two layer boards. So two layer means two copper layers, one on the top, one on the bottom. And so on the bottom there, I provided a side view where um, you're basically punching holes from the top and the bottom um, for uh, that represent the vias. And they basically connect the top and the bottom and you want to connect as uh, as many places that you can without like ruining the physical integrity of the board because you're still putting holes in the board. But um, yeah, I actually did this on my micro mouse and I, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, oh. I, I thought it was really cool. Right. That's also another reason that you might want to keep orphans is for the structural integrity of the board. Having uh, copper makes the whole entire structure like stronger, basically. So yeah. removing copper, you know, it's just basically the substrate left, which isn't as strong. So having multiple layers there will help Okay, so it's like a trade-off between structural integrity and electromagnetic uh, interference. I mean, if you have weight constraints, then you'll probably definitely want orphans yeah. off. Or if you know you're looking more specifically at um, the EMI, so electromagnetic interference or things like that, yeah. having copper on there does not help. But <laughs> unless it does, like you want large ground planes because you have an antenna that's like going to it or something like that. Yeah um yeah so that brings us kind of like to uh this other concept that you might have heard a lot and so i know at least for last year and this year all the micro mouse leads were hounding people about their pcb design about placing their decoupling capacitors and stuff so this is going to be the explanation of why they're important and why they kept on telling you to do this a certain way and so um, decoupling and bypass capacitors there's two different uh functions and they both use capacitors and Capacitors are essentially like really useful things in uh, uh, small embedded systems or small embedded circuits because it allows um, basically steady, it normalizes the signals so that there's less noise. And so, um, yeah, so we're going to go into decoupling and there's basically, you can have like two different setups. Um, we don't, we're not, not going to go into like the advantages of each, but uh, I guess you can do that. But there's just oh. two different ways, like two different standards. And Can I actually yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. use the share screen for a second? I just want to do something on the whiteboard feature. Yeah, go ahead. Wait, should we explain what they are first and then we can go into that? Or? Oh, yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so essentially decoupling capacitors are um, coupling are not, they're not coupling. They're, they're, they're isolating, so decoupling uh, your local component that... Um, draws in some power, let's say like, for example, a decoupling setup one, the load, uh, you're basically kind of like separating uh, the way that it draws uh, voltage um, away from just drawing it straight from the DC power. And this is, um, this doesn't really make too much sense in like the small, small basic case. But um, imagine if you're having like one big board with a lot of different components, each drawing their own power, each drawing different amounts of power at different rates. And so having decoupling capacitors associated to each of those active devices will enable a much more smoother um, DC power in general, because um, this will prevent um, voltage spikes and current spikes for the other parts of your 
uh, for the other active devices on your board. And so that's essentially uh, the purpose of decoupling capacitors. And um, they're, um, they're supposed to be placed as close as possible to the component that you're decoupling. And so there's two different setups for that. And then um, before Evan gets into his whiteboard session, I guess I'll explain bypass capacitors. And uh, essentially bypass and decoupling, they're commonly used um, or interchanged, but there's slight differences. And so bypass, uh, I guess you can just see visually like decoupling here is like set up in parallel uh, for voltage and ground. But then here we have bypass uh, in series. And so um, basically their main purpose is to prevent noise from entering the system. And essentially um, this goes back to like the impedance. I think you'll learn it in uh, ENM physics, but essentially capacitors have a very uh, unique quality that um, they resist uh, changes in voltage and stuff. So um, being able to um, neglect that change in voltage uh, enables it to be really good, like kind of like filter, I guess, um, in order to short out those AC signals and uh, leave it to be a clean DC signal. So you wouldn't want to use these for like uh, AC signals, like AC power source. So a battery uh, would be where you'd be using this, which is most common in a lot of embedded systems. All right, Evan, did you want to share your screen? Oh, yeah, I was just going to do a small little drawing to basically yeah. say what decoupling capacitors like do do. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, can you, can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay, so say you have a signal coming in, right? So this is like your signal. This is how we normally view signals. It's like a sort of square wave. So what a decoupling capacitor does, you know, it's basically the RC time constant. It smooths out the wave when you're doing a signal, right? That way you don't have, because our capacitors resist large changes in voltage at the same time. So say there was like some massive shock, having a decoupling capacitor will help protect your system just in general because it smooths the um, voltage change. So you're not gonna have like, oh, it instantly goes to like, you know, one million volts or something like that, something bad, but yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. I guess another good way to think about like decoupling capacitors, uh, decoupling, not bypass, uh, share screen. Yeah. All right. Um, another good way to think about capacitors is that um, they're kind of like small, uh, they store charge. So they, they kind of like small springs, right? Um, and they store charge. And if you put them next to your components, then uh, your active device will have uh, kind of like a very small reservoir to draw in on before it starts drawing uh, uh, power from the main power bus or your, your DC power in this case. And so it allows um, time for uh, it to adjust and basically not have that initial hump. So that's another good way to think about it. All right, so we're gonna go into more specifically about um, the differences between setup decoupling, setup one and setup two. So I guess, Evan, if you wanna take care of this. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, here, wait, can you actually go back to the other slide? Go ahead. Yeah. So you can see in this example, in the decoupling setup two, there's two different valued capacitors. So this might, um, different capacitors have basically different operating ranges or like they'll operate better in certain frequencies, right? So having yeah. capacitors of different uh, like capacitances will help you filter out different frequencies of noise from your system, right? But then you also specifically look at this configuration. So decoupling capacitors are supposed to go basically as close to the IC as possible, right? But after that, if you have multiple, you'll want to put the lowest value closest to the IC because it has the least um, capacitance. So the more wire it has, the more inductance gets added um, to the system, the more likely it is to just cancel out the capacitance that you added, right? So that's sort of why you would use decoupling setup too, is if you have um, a situation where you have, need two capacitors to filter out noise, and um, the rule is you want to put the closer, or you want to put them as close as possible, but you want to put the smaller one closer. Yeah, and then they each capacitor can kind of like filter out a different kind of frequency um, from your uh, input signal. Yeah, so that's basically what this is saying. And then, there, yeah, other sorry. Question, is there a rule of thumb for uh, which values to pick, like for decoupling sub two? You, yeah, there is yeah. Two, so. Yeah, I was actually gonna skip, I wrote something about that. <laughs> 
okay <laughs> but yeah in general like for decoupling setup too right um basically for noise frequency um uh for low frequency um your decoupling capacitor would should be like one microfarad to 100 microfarad and then for high frequency noise decoupling uh you want it from 0 0.01 microfarad to 0 0.1 microfarad so yeah there's like a couple of magnitudes difference between them to take care of like the two um frequency um low and high frequency sides does that answer right. your question yes thank you yeah uh, we put the information in the slides as well uh, it'll be in the comments um for this slide yeah good question thanks for reminding me um yeah and so that kind of brings us oh, we're doing pretty good on time um so yeah that kind of brings us into um wrapping all of those uh key features together and uh, making your board like kind of like the best that it can be um, there's obviously a lot of different opinions and ways to do this and um yeah, Evan and I just kind of got into this, but this is kind of like what we've learned and we're willing to share that with you. And so essentially, um, EC, uh, EMC and EMI, electromagnetic compatibility, um, is the ability of electrical equipment and systems to function acceptably. And that is done by limiting the unintentional generation of uh, electromagnetic interference or EMI. And so basically I read this as reduce noise to make the PCB work. <laughs> So it will function more as um, what you designed it to be in the schematic uh, if you um, decrease the noise, which is pretty straightforward. All right, so going into this, um, this kind of relates to a lot of really cool physics topics that uh, I guess EE would be going through, but you don't have to like have a in very good understanding of this, but it's kind of like a high level overview. And so um, EMC is the one that's uh, is like the process of measuring um, EMIs and so essentially um, like the pictures down below they'll be taking your PCB into a room and this is I guess this is for like really like critical PCBs uh, I'm not it's not that's why like people don't stress it too much on, like micro mouse or AP but this is kind of cool I think but um, yeah in order to like decrease the noise of your PCB they can bring it into a room and like use some antennas to like measure it and then they'll measure basically what is called the far field effects of your PCB. And so essentially you can see in the top graph here, um, there's a lot of things going on here, but basically all you need to know is that there's near field and far field effects. And so the axis here is um, the X is the distance. So I think that's in like wavelengths. So they convert it to distance. And then um, on the Y axis is the, uh, not, it's like some it's impedance of some sort. I think it's the intrinsic impedance of the electromagnetic wave. And so if you like study like electromagnetic waves, I think this is in um, 101A and 101B, um, you'll, you'll learn that um, electromagnetic waves are composed of two components. And I'm not gonna go into that, but electromagnetic, electric field and uh, magnetic field. And basically if you, um, how this relates to your PCB is if you can arrange some things so that um, or go about routing your PCB in certain ways that you, you can basically lower um, a lot of like the current or the, the um, voltages that are associated with that, and that correlates to the effects of electric uh, of effects of the electric field and the magnetic field. So those come from Mac, uh, Maxwell's equations, and it's just really cool how um, just small changes in your PCB, um, how things like loop around, can uh, change like the levels of noise that's produced. And so, yeah, basically we're just playing around with these two curves, the magnetic and the electric field curves. And basically that will affect this end goal here, which is our far field. Yeah, so do we have any questions on that? No, okay. But yeah, you don't have to uh, understand all of this, but this is just like a really cool background. And so this kind of goes into um, how do you design a good PCB without, uh, with the least amount of noise? And so um, the first thing that is like, uh, you can, the first, uh, I guess, piece of control that you can have over determining what's a good PCB or not is um, the placement of your components. And that's really important. Knowing like your components and uh, its properties is really key to understanding uh, how to place them. And so uh, we're gonna go over that in a small example here with like, I think like, a, it's like a Swiss army knife of a bunch of different kinds of components, which is really cool. And we're gonna go into it. So. 
Um, you see this board here. When I first saw it, I was like, oh, there's nothing wrong, wrong with it. But there's a lot of things wrong with it. Uh, it's probably going to fail some EMC requirements. And um, I guess um, just from this, you guys can go over it on your own too. But um, some key features of this is that it's a four-layer setup. So I guess here on this side, uh, we have four layers. So we have two signals and then ground and then power. So that's a little different than what we've done normally with our two-layer setup, which just we usually set to ground and power. But um, a lot of those things uh, carry over. And it will also answer that um, decision of choosing what, whether the polygon uh, or the, yeah, the polygon uh, copper port is on the top or the bottom. This, this kind of like goes into that. Um, yeah. So just examining this uh, board with all of its components on here, uh, we see that it's a, a mixed board, so mixed signal board. So that means there's digital and analog uh, signals flying through the thing. Uh, a MicroMaster, the same thing. Pretty much a lot of your PCBs will have this kind of um, uh, this kind of setting, I guess. Um, we also see that there's three I/O ports. So here we have an input, a voltage input. Here we here we have a uh, acoustic signal input. I'm guessing that this is some kind. I didn't design this board. Uh, I got it from online, but um, I'm guessing it takes in some kind of analog signal because it goes into this analog amplifier. So it's probably like a really sensitive um, input here. And then we output these uh, this digital signal. So yeah, that's so there's three three input output ports. All right. And then uh, we have various components that are at different powers. So they provide different frequencies. So here we have like a power supply. And then um, here we have a gate array. So that's like high frequency. And then here we have a 64 megahertz uh, clock. So clocks are really high frequency for anyone who's like really new to this. And then maybe like analog is pretty low frequency. That's kind of like the gist of it. Um, yeah, usually like digital um, components are a lot more high frequency, high power um, than analog. And so um, what else? There's some decoupling capacitors on here, as you can see. I guess it's all labeled. And um, the different dots indicate how they're connected to the plane. Eh, excuse me. <clears throat> and we're going to get into that. And so there are some issues that I mentioned earlier. Um, so what are those? So specifically, um, first one is a decoupling capac capacitors placement. There, what are these decoupling capacitors decoupling? <laughs> they're just kind of there. Um, it's hard to see what they're decoupling. So we're going to go into more how to um, make them function better. Um, there are these high frequency components. Those digital, this gate array is sandwiched in between uh, the IO ports. And uh, this could cause some problems because um, it could create some voltage differences um, that occur between the uh, input and the output. So like both ends of the board, because I guess um, they act as antennas in a way, or very small uh, voltage difference. So that's kind of like a source of noise. Um, there's also some really long traces between the I.O. Um, and the clock line. So here we can see coming out of the 64 megahertz clock, it's kind of long. We can make it shorter, obviously. And um, this ensures that you don't get enough or you don't get as much interference from other signals as your signals traveling into whatever processor that you have, such as this gate array. And then um, the final um, issue that we have with this board, <laughs> we collectively have issues with this board, <laughs> um, is that the analog is tied to the same uh, ground plane as the high frequency components. And this uh, will be an issue because analog is really sensitive, uh, more sensitive to noise than digital because um, analog is like a range of values rather than digital. It's either like this, a discrete set of values. And so um, it's harder to filter out noise for analog signals. And let's see if I missed anything. Yeah, so the decoupling capacitors in this setup, the reason why I said that they're not decoupling anything really is because they, they're they acting as global decoupling. They're not placed near enough uh, the capacitors that are near enough the active devices that they're trying to um, like separate from the rest of the board. They're not acting uh, good enough. I guess in the analogy I said earlier, they're not like close enough so that they can act as that little charge reservoir. And so um, they won't really do anything um, for these uh, devices. And so um, let's see, uh, voltage and current spikes will be introduced, introduced to the board by these high frequency components and then they can't uh, decouple them successfully. And then I, I, I said, 
Oh yeah, yeah. So that's basically most of the issues that are with this port. As you can see, very subtle things just from the uh, placement of each of these devices. And so you can change a lot of that um, just by switching it around. Oh, and here kind of goes more into like tying in the analog with the digital grounds and uh, like what I said before, point four. And basically, um, you just have to understand that, you know, current, uh, it flows through a circuit and it comes back to its source like a, in, a, in a loop, essentially. And so um, if you put, okay, so I guess like the loop here would be coming in from this acoustic signal, in, in, <laughs> acoustic signal input, excuse me. And then it would be going into this analog amplifier. And then basically here's like the ground. It will be coming out of here, and basically it's tied into a ground plane. And so current likes to flow on the path of least resistance. And so it will try and find its way. It will basically disperse itself into this, um, into this board and try and find its way back to this point right here. And so mind that it's an analog signal. And so various, noise can be, uh, uh, various noises can be encountered by that signal, by the analog signal coming from this gate array which is tied to the same exact ground plane and so you'll have these like high frequency like the clock for example the clock's signal might uh, interfere with our analog and it's going to be very hard to take away that noise so basically uh, the solution to this is to manually trace um, a line from this ground to um, to this other uh, ground so basically completing the loop yourself and so um, since you're basically giving it its own path of least resistance, essentially, in order to complete itself. Or you could use separate ground planes for like more complicated um, PCB. So separate it from the high frequency and the analog. So essentially separate the digital ground and the A ground, as I've said here with the D ground and A ground. So yeah, that's pretty important. So yeah, so after... Um, solving a couple of these issues. I know I just solved like, um, just like that, tying in the analog or tying it back to itself. Um, essentially, you can get from this original layout from what we had before to this new layout. And so you can see that um, this solution takes care of a lot of the factors that we discussed before. And it's smaller, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just a coincidence. But you can see here, uh, we'll just go off uh, sequentially. Um, our decoupling capacitors are right next to the active devices that they're decoupling. As you can see here, um, each of these are connected like almost directly on top of the, to the pins that they're supposed to be, of the devices that they're supposed to be decoupling. And so here I have a little blurb. Um, this kind of goes into that question that someone asked earlier about what order is it that you put the planes and it has to do with how you're gonna decouple it. And so whatever plane that's farther, from your components. So your components are on the top, right? Like just think about that side view that I was talking about earlier, the components are on the top. And then, um, and then the plane that's farther. So I guess like the bottom plane, uh, that's the one that you want. That's like the side that you want to couple. And so basically it kind of goes down to the placement of your um, uh, decoupling capacitors. And if that makes it easier for you or not, which um, order that you want your polygons to be in, on the top or on the bottom. And so this situation, you have uh, yeah, two choices as well, top and bottom, but it's like a four layer board. So I guess it doesn't matter too much, but um, yeah, you can still do the same thing for a two layer board. It's also useful to note that you can see the Gatorade component in the left side. All of these p our black holes are going to the power plane, right? But yeah. on the right picture, you have decoupling capacitors to all of those pins. It would be the same thing if for your, it's what, what we do for the air copter and micro mouse. You have these decoupling capacitors going to every single like VDD pin. Anything that's getting, you know, direct power, you'll decouple it because yep. it'll protect your circuit. Yep. And protect all the other components on your circuit. I guess that's the same thing. But yeah, it's so that's the same yeah. thing with every single component on here that is yeah. getting power, it has a decoupling capacitor. All those black circles all yeah. have decoupling capacitors now, which is good practice. Yeah, and they're basically on top of the pins. And um, yeah, so that's why when people kind of like place random capacitors here and there, it's like kind of nullifying the effect of uh, the, the drawing power and you'll get voltage spikes. And that's not good for um, 
like your MCU or something. Like you don't want a lot of voltage going through that. Yeah. So that's common sense. Um, yeah. So we went through decoupling capacitors. Next up is uh, the high frequency components versus the position of the IO ports. And so you can see here that we have like the clock is here and the gate array is, is here. So a gate array is like FEGA or like, this is like almost like MCU. And then um, here we have digital analog converter. And um, yeah, and so those are on here on the left hand side, but then here on the right, uh, on the bottom here, we have uh, these IO ports. And so they're kind of like spaced away. And so this is kind of arbitrary, like how far is good enough, but um, just kind of like with the space that you have on your board, you probably have some space constraints, like try to like adjust for that. And then um, you can see that uh, the analog, let's see, sorry, this is in the way. Yeah, the analog ground. Okay, okay. So here's like a special point about this one. The analog ground in here is not tied directly to the output ground, but in here that um, we've adjusted for that so that it's closer to the uh, actual uh, ground. And so that's kind of like also the arbitrary part of the PCB. Um, but uh, I guess we did make a slight improvement by placing it closer um, to uh, the output of the ground that it's supposed to go to. So like completing the loop is still on the plane. Um, I guess it's really easy just to draw another trace. So we could just do that. <laughs> so like make like a little connection from the analog ground to its respective output. So yeah, that's like a, um, yeah. So that's like a really good overview on uh, basically fixing up this original layout that we had to this new layout and it was all done really subtly like basically just the components and how you trace it really matters to the performance and how much noise um, you will generate or to uh, reduce that and, and the placement of your components will reduce that um, as much as possible and so um, so here we have the splitter and this, this is, is so, uh, yeah. sort of like yeah, this well, is like final part. Yeah, yeah, we're almost done here. <laughs> um, but um, essentially for the splitter, um, I, I uh, said before that we have different one solution to the tying the or one solution for dealing with um, analog grounds is to make a special plane for itself. So here's like Eagle's way of implementing that. And so it's like a custom part in the MicroMouse library. And then basically you can uh, put two of like different signals together. It basically, physically, you'll just have uh, one route uh, go on to another route and uh, they'll connect. So you usually want to do this like far away um, from your analog parts, but yeah, here's the library for it. We provide you the link. And then here's like a board view of this. So basically it'll show up as an error, but um, you can ignore it. Like if you know that the error is just with the splitter, um, it doesn't like, Eagle doesn't like having two signals with different names on top of each other, but you know, functionally, they'll behave the same. So you know there's also a special setting you have to change. You see how in the top screen, um, towards the left side, there's that sort of uh, octagon with a slash to it. You have to select that to be able to have traces go over onto this component because it's going basically through a plane. Um, when I was making this component, I just selected with 100 um, traces and put it onto the splitter. The splitter is actually really, really tiny. So you want to use large traces to connect the planes, right? You also want to make this, like if you can make it bigger, you probably want to do that, but you only want them, you want to connect them also close to like the main uh, power source, the main ground of the circuit. So if it's powered by a battery, that's probably where you want to try and connect this. So this is like if you're trying to connect your analog ground and motor ground and digital ground um, all together at the end instead of having to name them all ground and separate them um, throughout your circuit just using normal methods. This makes it easier, but you will have to ignore an error at the end. Yep. And so here are some really good resources. I encourage all of you guys to um, go ahead and watch a lot of these videos. I've included some playlists here. Um, my good friend from Carnegie Mellon actually recommended me a lot of these videos. And so Evan and I were researching a lot from what you heard from this lecture from these videos. And they're just really good um, ways to learn about PCB design that they don't teach you in class. So yeah, really good. They don't, they don't teach you PCBs in class. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Except for 163 a little bit. Really? 
Well, because it's, it's to write that book. down. Ah, I see. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. So thank you guys so much for attending. I know it was kind of long, but uh, if you have any more questions, you can always contact us in our Slack and our emails. And then next lecture will be on week five, Wednesday at the same time, seven to eight. And uh, it'll be about LT spike. So circuit analysis, analysis. And then make sure you guys all stay safe. And please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, we're moving a lot of our content out there. So yeah, thank you guys. If you guys have any questions, make sure to ask. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, yeah. The, sli the slides will, there will be, will there be a link to the slides at, at the YouTube video or whatever? Yes, Every, all the information we provide there too, yeah. All right, cool. All right, thank you too. That was really informative. Yep, thanks for coming.